Welcome back to G4's English. I'm Jennifer, and this is your one hour weekly English lesson. This lesson will help you improve all areas of your English, your English speaking, reading, writing, vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation. Let's get started. First, let's focus on your English speaking skills. I'm going to explain 10 bad speaking habits that I commonly see students make. Now, I'll share how you can avoid these habits so you can look very professional and confident when speaking in English. Now, before we start the lesson, I want to ask for your feedback on this style of lesson. So what I'm doing is I'm taking individual lessons that I posted and I'm combining them into one weekly lesson. So you have all the individual lessons in one place. You can download it. You can review it anytime. If you're going for a long drive or a long walk, you have this one lesson. So let me know if you like this lesson or you don't like this lesson. Share your thoughts in the comments below. Now let's improve your speaking skills. The first bad habit is using one word answers. Let's say you were at a conference and your boss asks you, how was the conference? And you reply back and you say, good, great, awesome. What do you notice about these answers? They're all one word answers. Now it might seem a little comical that that's all you would say, but I hear this from students all the time. I'll ask them about their vacation and they were on a two week vacation in another part of the world and all they say was good, great, okay, not bad. Very short answers. This doesn't sound very professional and you definitely don't sound advanced in English. The, an easy way to solve this problem is to answer in a complete sentence. Repeat the question, the conference was good. Now still, this isn't enough information. You can then expand on that and you can provide the reason why or you can provide one example from the conference or the trip. The conference was good because I met a lot of new people in my field and I have a lot of new contacts. This sounds so much more professional and advanced compared to good. Our next bad habit is using weak words. Let's say your boss asks you if you can have the report finished by the end of the day and you reply back and say, I think so, I'll try. These are all weak words because they imply that you might not finish the job or finish the request. So instead of saying, I think I can, change that to something more confident, something stronger. I know I can finish the report by the end of the day. I promise I'll finish the report by the end of the day. You can count on me to finish the report by the end of the day. The next bad habit is using very basic words. Basic words like good, okay, fine, all of these are very beginner words and they don't sound very professional and they don't make you look very confident either. So if you simply change that to something more advanced, instead of saying the conference was good, you say the conference was very beneficial. And then you can move on and provide more information like we talked about in the first bad habit because often the one word answers that you want to avoid are also very basic words. Now let's move on with our next point. One bad habit you definitely want to avoid is speaking too quickly. So imagine right now I'm telling you about the rules of something and I'm speaking very fast. Do you think you'll be able to understand very well if that's how I spoke? Well, a lot of students actually think they speak too slowly, but in my experience, that's not true. They actually speak too fast. And when you speak too fast, it's difficult to understand, to follow your story. So just 
take a breath, put some pauses into your words as well, and that will help you slow your pace. Now let's talk about word fillers. Word fillers are those words like, um, uh, uh, well, you know, like. These words that don't have any meaning, but people add them to their speech when they're trying to think about what to say next. So imagine you're in a meeting and your boss asked you to tell everybody about how the project is going and you reply back and say, well, um, the project's going um, pretty good. Um, well, you know, um, we just need to, um, obviously that doesn't seem very professional and you certainly won't feel very confident when you have all those ums. Let's talk about eye contact. This can be a very difficult one, especially because culturally people have different rules for eye contact. In North American culture, it's considered polite and professional to make eye contact with the person you're talking to, but you don't maintain eye contact 100% of the time. You can absolutely look away, look down, look up, but you want to maintain eye contact at least 50% of the time. Next, let's talk about intonation. Intonation is the natural raising and falling of your voice. Our voices do this naturally. Now, if I'm way up high and then I come down low and then I go way back up high and then I come down low, that's not very professional and it won't make you look very confident. But you also don't want to talk on one specific note and maintain that note. Right now, I probably sound more boring to you because I don't have intonation in my voice. That's the impact of not having that natural rising and falling, and I hear this from students all the time. So you could do some vocal exercises and try to go up higher and then come down lower and just try to vary your intonation, which is the rising and falling of your voice when you speak to sound more professional and to appear more confident. Our next bad habit is on enthusiasm and a lack of enthusiasm. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say you went to this conference and you want to tell your boss and your colleagues that the conference was very beneficial and you learned a lot and you made a lot of useful contacts. But if you deliver this, if you communicate this without enthusiasm, they're not going to understand the message. The conference was great. I met a lot of people. It was very beneficial. It was really interesting. A lack of enthusiasm, your intonation goes down, your volume goes down. Just think of it as being very tired or bored or not interested. So think about the enthusiasm that you have in your voice. Now part of showing your enthusiasm and part of being confident is also your body language. Notice how I said when you lack enthusiasm, it's like you're tired. When you're tired, you have a hard time keeping your body up, but it doesn't look very professional and I probably don't look very confident right now. And same people often, they speak, they cover up their body, which makes them appear very small. That doesn't seem very confident either. When you're confident, just bring your shoulders back and take up about as much space as your shoulders go. Think of that as your box, your communications box, and that's where you want to be. You want to make sure you stay upright in this box when you're communicating because that will make you seem very confident and then also that will help with your intonation and your enthusiasm because when your body is all crunched down, it actually impacts the intonation of your voice. And when you're upright more, you can get more enthusiasm, more intonation from your voice as well. So remember, shoulders back and pay attention to your body language. Now finally, let's talk about 
hand <laughs> gestures. So hand gestures is just simply using your hands when you communicate. Now, there are some things you don't want to do, like completely not having any hand gestures. So if I did the entire video like this, maybe you could watch it for 30 seconds, but imagine watching it for 10 minutes where you don't see my hands at all. Now, if my hands are like this, most likely my body is going to start to to sag as well, and I'm not going to have good body language. But when I bring my hands into it, I'm more likely to keep my shoulders back. Remember I said you want to have a communication box because you also don't want your hands wailing and frailing about and just being all over the place as well. You want to keep your hand gestures within this communications box. So just keep them very slight, very natural. You don't want to go too far away, just close to the body, but just keep them going. And that will, again, help you with your body language. It will make you look a lot more confident and you'll appear more professional because all professional speakers use their hands when they're speaking. And if you avoid these 10 bad speaking habits, I know you're going to look instantly more professional and you're going to feel more confident as well. So which bad habit do you think you need to improve the most? Share that in the comments below. Now let's move on and focus on your English reading and at the same time you'll improve your grammar, your vocabulary, and your pronunciation. So we're going to read a news article that talks about the release of Disney's The Little Mermaid. Let's get started. Let me read the headline. The Little Mermaid makes box office splash with 95.5 million opening. First, let's talk about this makes a splash, makes a splash. Here it says box office splash to describe what type of splash it made, but this is a fun idiom that you can add to your speech and the idiom is to make a splash, to make a splash. And this means to attract a lot of attention. So you might say, Sarah really made a splash at the conference. So maybe she gave a presentation and it was really engaging and interesting and informative and a lot of people were talking to her about it. So she attracted a lot of attention. She made a splash. She made a splash. Now, do you know why they chose to use this specific idiom in the headline? Well, because it's also a joke because splash has to do with water, the literal definition of splash, and the Little Mermaid, of course, takes place in water <laughs> because right now, imagine I'm in water and I'm doing this. I'm splashing to splash. So if you're right here and I'm doing this with water, you would say, Jennifer, stop splashing me. Why are you splashing me? <laughs> so that's the literal definition. But remember idioms, they don't follow the literal definition. They just chose to use this idiom because of the water connection. So to splash, to splash, this is to move water, I guess, boo, to move water in the direction of someone or something. So to move water, kids love splashing in water, but hey, adults love it too. It's pretty fun. Let's continue on. The Little Mermaid makes box office splash with $95.5 million opening. Okay. The Little Mermaid made moviegoers want to be under the sea on Memorial Day weekend. This is not an idiom <laughs> to be under the sea. They're using this as a little joke because one of the main songs from the movie is called Under the Sea. Remember, they sing a lot in Disney movies, and this is one of the songs Under the Sea, if you remember it. Okay. Let's take a look at this though. Moviegoer. Made moviegoers. 
This is a noun, a moviegoer. And can you imagine who this would represent? A moviegoer. I'm a moviegoer. What does that mean? A moviegoer is someone who goes to the movies. A moviegoer, because remember, it's a noun. So you need the article. Here we have plural. So there's no article because moviegoers. A moviegoer, someone who goes to the movies. In North America, when we say go to the movies, it means I went to the movie theater. Movie theater. In North America, we commonly call the cinema a movie theater. So we just shorten it to movies. I went to the movies last weekend. It means I went to the movie theater to watch a movie. So a moviegoer is not someone who watches a movie at home. They have to go to the movie theater, the cinema. Are you a moviegoer? I am not a moviegoer. I haven't gone to the movies, the movie theater for five years maybe, but of course I watch movies at home. I'm just not a moviegoer. What about you? Share that in the comments. Disney's live action remake of its 1989 animated classic easily outswam the competition. All right. This is another water joke. This is also not an expression. We use it in the literal context of to outswim someone means I swam faster than the person. So when you add out in front of an action verb, it means to do better than. So if I say I outran someone, it means I ran faster than another person who was running, usually in the sense of a competition. I'm racing against someone and I outran them. I ran faster than them. So this is not an idiom. It's in a very specific context of sports and competition. But again, they used it because of the water reference. But it, it means to perform better than. So easily performed better than is how you can think of it. Easily performed better than the competition. Now here, remake. If I add re in front of my verb, it means to do that verb again. So to remake it means to make it again. And this makes sense because The Little Mermaid was originally a cartoon, originally in 1989, but they just remade it. And this, the live action, Originally, it was a cartoon, an animated cartoon, but now, of course, real people. <laughs> Ariel and Ursula, they're real people. Obviously, Flounder the fish is not. The fish is still animated. So that's the live action remake. So with the verb remake, you might say, I had to remake the cake. So maybe you were making a cake, but at the same time you were watching one of my videos on YouTube and you forgot about your cake and it burned in the oven. So you had to remake it. I had to remake the cake. So you can use this in many different contexts. All right. Bringing in $95.5 million. So notice point. That's how I would vocalize this 95.5 million. And then I vocalize the money sign as dollars and it is plural. There's more than one dollar, one dollar singular, one million dollars. There's a plural on the dollars, but there is no plural on the million. I hear a lot of students say two millions. No, is two million dollars. The plural goes on the dollars. Bringing in $95.5 million on 4,320 screens in North America. 
according to studio estimates Sunday. So let's take a look at this. According to and after you need a someone or something. So this a something could be according to the report. This would be a something according to the report. According to Jim, who wrote the report. So this would be, of course, a someone. So according to, don't forget this preposition to. According to the report, according to Jim. Before we go on, are you enjoying this lesson? Do you enjoy learning in this way, studying real context? If so, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers in a real context, just like this on TV, YouTube, movies, and the news. So you can improve your listening skills and you can add all these common phrasal verbs, idioms, expressions, advanced vocabulary, advanced grammar to your speech. And you'll have me as your personal coach. So if you'd like to join, you can look in in the description for more information. Now let's continue on. And Disney estimates the film starring Halle Bailey as the mermaid Ariel and Melissa McCarthy as her sea witch nemesis Ursula. Okay, let's pause here. Nemesis. Listen to my pronunciation. Nemesis. Nemesis. A nemesis is your rival or your opponent. So someone, or sometimes even a something that you need to defeat. Something you need to defeat. This happens a lot in movies and books and TV. So think of any superhero. Let's take Batman. And who does Batman need to defeat? He needs to defeat Joker, right? The Joker. That is Batman's nemesis. It's his rival, his opponent. But you may have an opponent in a race or a competition. In that case, the word nemesis is too strong. When I hear nemesis, I think there's going to be a battle. There's going to be violence involved. And that's why I think more of movies and TV and superheroes. I don't really think of just being in a race or a competition where you have an opponent. So think of it in that sense as well. There's probably some sort of violence or extreme conflict involved. Nemesis. Her sea witch nemesis Ursula will reach $117.5 million. Don't forget that S dollars by the time the holiday is over. Okay, this was a very long sentence, but let's take the short form of the sentence. We have the film, and then this is additional information about the film. The film will reach this amount by the time the holiday is over. So this is a nice advanced sentence structure you can practice. You have the future simple, and then you have by the time, okay? So let's try that. Let's try by the time the week is over. What will happen? So, it will rain <laughs> by the time the week is over. So by the time the week is over, that's the last day of the week. And sometime between now and the end of the week, it will rain. So here, future simple, it will rain by the time. And then, and then you can have any time. It doesn't necessarily have to be over. It could be by the time I go on vacation. So I will buy a new bathing suit by the time I go on vacation. By the time I go on vacation. So this is a nice sentence structure. You can try your own sentence in the comments. It ranks as the fifth biggest Memorial Day weekend opening ever. 
So rank is talking about the score, right? So if you're in first place, that's your rank. Second place, third place, fourth place. So this is fifth. It ranks as. It's its overall performance. Now, I've saved all the notes that I'm taking here in a free lesson PDF. You can look in the description for the link to download it. And you can also download this free speaking guide, how to speak English fluently and confidently in six easy steps. You can download this absolutely free from my website. So the link is in the description as well. Let's continue. It displaces Fast X in the top spot. So they're talking about it, the movie, The Little Mermaid, because of its overall rank, its performance, its score, it displaces. So first we had Fast X, but now The Little Mermaid is going to displace it. So it's going to take its spot. It displaces Fast X in the top spot. The 10th installment in the Fast and Furious franchise starring Vin Diesel has lagged behind more recent releases in the series. So when you lag behind, it means you're not performing as well as you could. So you're performing slower than expected or not as good as expected. So to perform less than expected. But we also use this in a, a physical distance. So remember before we talked about running or swimming and you can out swim or outrun the competition. Well, I might be running and then I realize that my competitor, not my nemesis, because I'm not going to violently fight them. <laughs> my competitor is lagging behind. I know they can run faster than they're currently running. Why is my competitor lagging behind? Why are they running slower than they, they can run? And maybe a, a, even in transportation, a train could be lagging behind. It's not moving as quickly as it can move. So there could be some mechanical issue and that's why it's lagging behind. But in this case, they're talking about the performance, not physical movement. So the film, the 10th film in Fast and Furious, are you watching that series? I am not, I'll stick to my Disney movies, <laughs> has lagged behind more recent releases in the series, bringing in $23 million domestically for a two week total of $108 million for Universal Pictures. Notice here, two week, there's no S on it, right? Because this is being used as an adjective and adjectives don't have a plural form. So it's the difference between I went on a vacation. Now let's say I want to add an adjective. I could say I went on a two week vacation. This is an adjective. But if I want to just talk about the time reference for my vacation, the length of time, then I do add the S. I went on a vacation for two weeks. This is plural. This is an adjective, so it is not plural. This is a time reference, so it's plural. The performance of The Little Mermaid represents something of a bounce back for Disney's animated to live action remake. So remember, they remade The Little Mermaid. First it was animated, and now it's live action. So they went from animated to live action. Notice here, bounce back bounce back. When you bounce back, it's another way of saying recover. So this, because it's a noun, it would be recovery. It's a recovery. So we'll learn later on that they say that the live action remakes, they were doing poorly, but now they've bounced back. So they're recovering in terms of their performance is going from not very good to better. We use this in a medical context as well. So let's say you're sick 
you're not feeling well, but the doctor wants to tell you it's not serious. You'll recover. The doctor could say, don't, don't worry. Don't worry. It's just a cold. You'll bounce back, bounce back quickly. You'll recover quickly. In this case, it's being used as a verb, but here they're using it as a noun, I'll bounce back. So in this case, it's recovery because that's the noun form and the verb form is recover. You'll recover quickly. So they're talking about the Little Mermaid film because of its performance. It's considered a bounce back for their remakes and makes it likely they'll keep coming indefinitely. Poor reception and the pandemic had some recent reboots. In this case, reboot is just another word for remake, but remake is the more common one. We use reboot more in the sense of starting again. So to start an electronic device again. So that's not how they're using it in this context. They're using it to replace the word remake to just talk about making it again, but that isn't how it's normally used. When you reboot a device, I will power down my computer or my phone, usually because it's, it has some sort of bug or an issue and then they'll say, oh, just try rebooting it. So turn it off and turn it back on again. So recent reboot, same as remake, either performing poorly or skipping theatrical release for Disney Plus, including Dumbo, Milan, and Pinocchio. So Dumbo, Milan, and Pinocchio, these are three other Disney movies that they remade into live action films, but they didn't do very well. And they didn't even go to the theaters. They only released them on Disney plus their streaming service. They didn't release them in the theaters, probably because they didn't think they were going to perform very well. So when you skip something, it means you, you miss it. You miss it. So you don't go to it or you don't do it. So to miss it or missing theatrical release. You hear this a lot with events. So you might say, I think I'm going to skip the party tonight, which means I'm going to miss it. I'm not going to go or I'm not going to do it. Or someone might say, you can't skip the meeting today. The CEO will be there, which means you can't not do it. You have to do it. You can't skip the meeting today. Let's continue. The opening puts it in the top tier of Disney's remakes. So top tier is one of the highest ranks, highest positions, top tier with a similar performance to 2019's Aladdin though it was well short of 2017's Beauty and the Beast, which opened to more than $170 million, and 2019's The Lion King, which brought in more than $190 million in its first weekend. Have you seen any of these remakes? I've seen all three. I love Disney movies. I'm very excited to watch The Little Mermaid. Although I'm not a moviegoer, so I'll watch it at home. <laughs> what about you? Oh, and that's the end of the article. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll go to the beginning of the article and I'll read it from start to finish. And this time you can focus on my pronunciation. Let's do that now. The Little Mermaid makes box office splash with $95.5 million opening. The Little Mermaid made moviegoers want to be under the sea on Memorial Day weekend. 
Disney's live-action remake of its 1989 animated classic easily outswam the competition, bringing in $95.5 million on 4,320 screens in North America, according to Studio Estimate Sunday. And Disney estimates the film, starring Halle Bailey as the mermaid Ariel and Melissa McCarthy as her sea witch nemesis Ursula, will reach $117.5 million by the time the holiday is over. It ranks as the fifth biggest Memorial Day weekend opening ever. It displaces Fast X in the top spot, the 10th installment in the Fast and Furious franchise starring Vin Diesel has lagged behind more recent releases in the series, bringing in $23 million domestically for a two-week total of $108 million for Universal Pictures. The performance of The Little Mermaid represents something of a bounce back for Disney's animated to live action remakes and makes it likely they will keep coming indefinitely. Poor reception and the pandemic had some recent reboots either performing poorly or skipping theatrical releases for Disney+, Plus, including Dumbo, Mulan, and Pinocchio. The opening puts it in the top tier of Disney's remakes with a similar performance to 2019's Aladdin, though it was well short of 2017's Beauty and the Beast, which opened to more than $170 million, and 2019's The Lion King, which brought in more than $190 million in its first weekend. Now let's focus on phrasal verbs because native speakers use phrasal verbs all the time. And in this lesson, we're going to focus on phrasal verbs with get, and you're going to learn the top 40 phrasal verbs with get. And at the end of this section, there's a quiz. Let's go. To get ahead. This means to progress. So to make progress towards something. And we most commonly use this in a career setting or academic setting. For example, if you want to get ahead, you need fluent English. Would you agree with that? Put that in the comments. If you want to get ahead, you need fluent English. Now notice how I didn't specify get ahead in what? If you want to get ahead at work in your career, so don't forget that. But you can also just say if you want to get ahead. To get along with. Most students know this one. Do you know this one? When you get along with someone, it means you have a good relationship with that person. I really get along with my boss. But we commonly use this in the negative. I don't get along with my boss. So you can use it in both the positive or the negative. So which describes you? I get along with my boss. I don't get along with my boss. To get away. This means to escape. So you can use this in two contexts. The criminal got away. So that means he escaped. The robber got away. He stole my car and he got away. He escaped. But we also use this more in the sense of to escape from your daily life, the difficulties of your daily life. Oh, I really need to get away. Work has been so busy. I don't get along with my boss. I need to get away. Another common phrasal verb with get away is to get away with something. And that something is negative. For example, she got away with the crime. This means she wasn't punished for the crime. So she did something wrong, but she got away with it. She got away with stealing the car. Notice that verb ing, with stealing the car. To get off lightly. This is when you are punished for something, but you're punished less severely than you anticipated. So maybe you forgot to submit a report at work, but you got off lightly. 
Your boss didn't fire you, but they did remove you from the account. So you were punished, but you were punished less severely than you expected. We also use this more in a criminal context. She stole the car, but she got off lightly. So maybe she didn't go to prison, she only had to do community service. To get back. This is used to say that you return to your original starting point. So let's say you're at home, but then you go to the store and then you return back home. So now you can say, I got back at seven o'clock. What time did you get back? Now you can specify the place. What time did you get back home, back to the office? Oh, I got back around seven. We commonly use this with your vacations. What time did you get back from your trip to Italy? Oh, I got back on Tuesday. You returned home from Italy. There's also the phrasal verb to get back to someone. You might say, oh, I really need to get back to John. When you get back to someone, it means you respond to that person. So if I say I need to get back to John, it means that John contacted me, but I have not replied. So maybe he asked me a question and I have not answered his question. I need to get back to John. Or you, John might say, when are you going to get back to me? When are you going to respond to my question? When you get back into something, it means you continue doing something that you stopped for a period of time. So let's say you decided to learn how to play guitar or piano and you play guitar every week for months and months and months and then you stop playing guitar. You get very busy at work, but then work is no longer busy. So you say, oh, I need to get back into guitar. I need to get back into my guitar lessons. So maybe you could use this with your language lessons. I need to get back into my English language class. To get back at someone, this is used for revenge. So if you didn't get back to John, which means you didn't reply to John and you didn't answer his question, maybe John will try to get back at you. He'll try to get revenge on you. So maybe he'll tell everyone that you're not very helpful and that's how he gets back at you. To get behind someone or something, this is when you support someone or something. So let's say your company has a new policy on their dress code and you like the policy. You can say, I can really get behind that policy. You support that policy. To get by, this is when you have just enough resources to survive. We most commonly use this with financial resources. So you might say with inflation, I can barely get by. So it means you can pay your bills, pay your mortgage, buy groceries, but just enough. At the end of the month, you have one or two dollars left in your account. I'm getting by. To get into trouble, I'm sure you do this all the time. When you get into trouble, it just means you enter that situation where you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, which is the trouble. So kids get into trouble all the time. That's why you don't leave your kids at home without an adult to supervise them because they're going to get into trouble. They're going to write on all the walls with crayon or eat all the cookies in the fridge. They're going to get into trouble. To get on, this is when you board, which means to enter certain vessels, certain methods of transportation. So you can get on a plane, a train, a boat, or a bus. 
I got on the plane. You entered the plane. You boarded the plane. To get on is also used as an expression to say that someone is old or has become very old. So you might say, my grandma is getting on, which means my grandma is now quite old. She's become very old. My grandma's getting on, so she has difficulty getting on a plane. Now, what's the opposite of on? I'm on the plane. I got on the plane, so now I need to get off the plane. And remember, you only get off certain methods of transportation. Planes, trains, boats, and buses. This is my stop. I need to get off the bus, get off the train. For vehicles, cars, vans, or trucks, you get in and get out of. I got in my car. I got out of my car. So don't confuse those two. We also use get in when you enter a room in a building or enter a house or a location. So this is very common at work. A coworker could ask you, oh, what time did you get in? They mean, what time did you enter the office? So you can also use it to mean, what time did you start your work day? Because when you enter the office building, technically you've started work. So what time did you get in? is another way of saying, what time did you start work? Now in this case, although the opposite of in is out, we have an expression to get off, which means to end work for the day. So someone could ask you, oh, what time do you get off today? What time do you usually get off? What time are you getting off tomorrow? This means what time do you finish work? Do you end work just for the day? To get out is also used as an expression of disbelief. So let's say your friend tells you, I won the lottery. Get out, get out, get out of here, get out of town. So you can add get out of here or less commonly, but still common, get out of town. It's just to show that I can't believe it. What? Get out. Get out. So if your friend says something very shocking or surprising, I'm moving to Antarctica. Get out. Get out of town. Why? Why are you doing that? When you get out of something or get out of doing something, it means you avoid doing something unpleasant. So I could say, I need to get out of cleaning the garage because that's unpleasant and I don't want to do it. To get together, this is when people organize socially. They join each other socially. So I might ask, what time are we getting together tonight? So what time are we going to meet each other, join each other and have dinner, have a cup of coffee, go for a walk, do something social. Now, if you specify the noun you need with, what time are you getting together with your friends tonight? You probably know this one, to get up. What time do you get up? This is when you leave your bed in the morning, first thing in the morning. So what time do you wake up? This is when you open your eyes, but then get up is when you actually leave your bed. So I wake up at 6 a.m., but I don't get up until 6.30. But how about this one, get up to? What did you get up to last night? This is a common way of simply asking what someone did. Oh, what did you get up to last night? Oh, not much, I watched a movie. We also use this one though to imply that someone is doing something wrong. My kids are always getting up to no good. This is the same thing as getting into trouble. But in a general context, oh, what did you get up to last night? It's what did you do last night? To get across. This is to communicate your idea successfully. So as a non-native speaker, you might say, I have a hard time getting my ideas across. 
I have a hard time communicating successfully. And if you have a hard time getting your ideas across, someone might ask you, what are you getting at? What are you getting at? This is another way of saying, what are you trying to communicate? What do you mean? So if you're trying to explain something, but the other person doesn't understand, they can say, what are you getting at? Now to get at can also mean to successfully reach something or find something or obtain something. So let's say I have a shelf and I have a hat on a very high shelf. I might say, I can't get at my hat. I can't reach my hat. To get rid of, this is when you throw away, so permanently remove unwanted items. So remember I said I wanted to get out of cleaning my garage because there's so many things I need to get rid of. There's so many unwanted things in my garage that I want to permanently remove. So maybe once a year, you can go through your entire house and get rid of things, get rid of unwanted things. To get wound up about something is when you get really angry about something. So let's say, your father doesn't like politics in general. So every time he sees something in the news about politicians, he gets wound up. He gets really angry. But you might say to your dad, get over it. Get over it. To get over something is when you tell someone they shouldn't have strong feelings towards something else. And those strong feelings are usually negative feelings. So if your dad gets really wound up about politics, you can say, oh, just get over it. It's not a big deal. You can, of course, get over someone. Do you know this one? When you get over someone, it means you no longer have romantic feelings for that person. So after my divorce, it took me years to get over my husband. It took me years to stop having romantic feelings towards my husband. Now someone could say, get over it, stop, being upset about the situation that you're no longer with your husband, but that might be a little insensitive. You can also get over an illness, which means you recover from an illness. It took me weeks to get over my cold. It took me weeks to recover from my cold. To get around, this is how you travel within an area. So if you're a tourist, you might Google, what's the best way to get around New York City? And of course, it's not by car. You don't wanna get around by car because the traffic is terrible. So walking is the best way to get around or taking the subway is the best way to get around New York City. When you get around to something or to doing something, it means you finally do something after not doing it for a long period of time. So let's say I was trying to get out of cleaning the garage because I didn't really want to get rid of all that unwanted stuff but I finally got around to cleaning the garage. So I finally cleaned the garage after a long time of not cleaning the garage. To get it together is when you take control of your life or your emotions. So let's say your friend is really upset because she broke up with her husband and she has not gotten over him. And you want to tell your friend to just get over it. But instead, you tell your friend, get it together. 
get it together. You need to take control of your emotions because your friend is crying all the time or she's really upset, she's really moody, angry, not pleasant to be around. And you tell your friend you need to get it together, which is a little bit of tough love, but sometimes it's necessary. There are many phrasal verbs with get through that have different meanings. When you get through something, it means you endure or deal with a difficult situation. It was really difficult for me to get through my father's death. So my father died, obviously that's a difficult situation. Hopefully you don't say get over it because that would be very insensitive. But I had a hard time getting through my father's death. So you can use this in a personal situation, you can use it in a work situation as well. I don't get along with my boss, so I have a hard time getting through our meetings. I have a hard time dealing with our meetings because I don't get along with my boss. When you get through something, it can also mean that you successfully finish something that was very difficult or time consuming. I finally got through the report. So you finished it, but it took you a really long time. It was difficult. When you get through to someone, it means that you successfully contact them after numerous attempts of trying to contact them. So let's say, I needed to get back to John, I needed to respond to John, but every time I called John, I got his voicemail. I could say, I'm having a hard time getting through to John. So I can't get back to John because I can't get through to him. But we also use to get through to someone when you're able to communicate something to someone in a way that they, they understand it. So I told my friend that she shouldn't quit her job and I explained all the reasons why and I finally got through to her. So I finally made her understand why she shouldn't quit her job. Your head is probably spinning right now with all of these phrasal verbs with get, but all you need is some practice, 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 and repetition. So let's do that right now with a quiz so you have a chance to review and practice these get phrasal verbs. So how did you do with that quiz? Don't worry if it was difficult. Again, you just need to practice. So review this video again multiple times. Try that quiz again. But share your score in the comments so you can come back and see how much you've improved. And share your favorite phrasal verb with get in the comments as well. Finally, I have another reading lesson for you because my students love these lessons and they're so amazing because they focus on all areas of your English at once, your vocabulary, grammar, reading, pronunciation. And this time we're talking about a legal case that's happening in Australia that's rocking the entire country. Don't worry, you'll learn exactly what that means in the lesson, so let's go. First, I'll read the headline, Ben Robert Smith, How Decorated Soldiers' Defamation Case Has Rocked Australia. So this man is Ben Robert Smith. Notice this, his 
name ends in an S, Roberts. But the second part of his last name starts in an S. So in this case, you only pronounce one S, Robert Smith, Robert Smith. If it were just Roberts, you would pronounce the S or just Smith, of course, S. But together, Robert Smith, Ben Robert Smith. This man is Ben Robert Smith. Notice these medals on his suit jacket. This is what it means by decorated soldier. If you say that a soldier is decorated, it means that they have been awarded medals for various reasons. So that's what decorated means. It's really used in a military context. Now, what is a defamation case? We're talking about a legal case. Defamation is the action of damaging someone's reputation, and that's done by either writing or saying bad things about that person. But the important thing is that those things are not true. So apparently the media said bad things about Ben Robert Smith, and they ruined his reputation. So he's suing them. So someone said bad things about Ben Robert Smith that damaged his reputation, but those things are not true. So he is suing them. I'm suing you for defamation. So if you said Jennifer is the worst teacher in the entire world and that ruined my reputation, I could sue you for defamation. So don't say that. <laughs> Hopefully you don't think that. Now, how this defamation case has rocked Australia. What does it mean to rock Australia? When something rocks someone or a group, such as the population of Australia, it means it shocks them. So this defamation case has shocked Australia. Let's continue on and find out why this case has rocked Australia. For months on end, Australia's most decorated living soldier. So remember I said decorated represents these medals. So he has the most medals of any living soldier. So he sat stoically in a Sydney courtroom. Let's stop here because there are a few things I want to review. Let's take a look at this for months on end, four months. Now we could just say four months and it would be completely correct. When you add on end, it simply stresses the continuation. So to emphasize or to stress continuation, emphasize continuation. So let's say I've been having issues with my computer. I could say my computer has been freezing for months on end. When I add on end, it just lets you know it didn't just happen once or twice. It's been happening continuously. So you can add that for months, for days, for weeks, for hours, whatever time reference you would like. And notice because we have four and then our time reference, this is a keyword for the present perfect or the present perfect continuous. For months on end, Australia's most decorated living soldier sat stoically. This is a great adverb and it means without showing your feelings, especially when something bad happens to you. So let's say that someone delivered some terrible news to me and as they delivered the news, I just, okay, thank you for sharing. I understand. That would be a stoic reaction. I reacted stoically, but if I went, no, why, 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 why? And I reacted very emotionally, that's the opposite of stoically. So he sat stoically in a Sydney courtroom as dozens of witnesses accused him of war crimes, bullying peers, and assaulting his mistress. Okay, so different people, dozens of, so of course, 
One dozen is 12. 12. I hope you know that. <laughs> One dozen equals 12. It's a very common measurement because things like eggs come in a dozen, a dozen eggs, 12 eggs, a dozen buns, 12 buns. So it's a common quantity, a dozen. So this is dozens of. So it would be 24 or 36, just more than 12. So a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people accused him, this decorated soldier, of these terrible things, war crimes, bullying peers, and assaulting his mistress. But Ben Robert Smith was not the one on trial. So he was not officially accused of these crimes. Because remember, in the headline, he, this man was actually suing someone else for defamation. But instead, now people are accusing him of all of these crimes. Hmm. And that probably explains why this case has rocked Australia. Now, you can download the lesson PDF that summarizes all the notes from this lesson. Just look in the description below or in the comment section for the link to download it. Let's continue. The 44-year-old had brought the case. So notice the past perfect. He had brought the case before he was accused of war crimes. So remember, the past perfect is used for a past action before another past action. Past action before another past action. So I'll write out that full sentence. He had, he had brought the case. When you bring a case to the criminal justice system, it just means you start or initiate a legal process. He had brought the case, the defamation case, before he was accused of war crimes. So remember, we have the past perfect, past perfect, and then this is the older action. And then we have the past simple for the newer action, but they are both past actions. The 44-year-old had brought the case, suing three Australian newspapers over a series of articles in 2018, which he says defamed him. So this is the verb form. Remember before we had defamation, which is a noun, but here to defame someone, that's the verb form. So the verb form is to defame someone, to defame. So the media defamed him. You defamed me when you said I was the world's worst teacher, so I'm suing you. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't do that. He argues they ruined his life by painting him as a callous man. So you can paint someone as something. And that's just another way of saying to describe someone as. She described me as the world's best teacher. Oh, I thank you so much. She painted me as the world's best teacher. So when you paint someone as, you don't just say Jennifer's the world's best teacher. You usually give examples. You tell a story. Just like when you paint a picture, you don't just put one blob. You put a lot of detail on that picture. So you provide details, information, examples, a story to describe someone. So the media painted him as a callous man. What? is this adjective callous. He's very callous. When someone is callous, it means they are unkind, cruel, and they don't have any sympathy or feelings for others. So it's a negative adjective. So let's say I shared some very bad news with you. I told you that a family member died and you said, let's get some pizza. 
I might say, well, that was very callous. That was very unkind. You didn't even offer any sympathy to this. You just wanted pizza. <laughs> so that was very callous. He's so callous. So the media painted him as a callous man who had broken the moral and legal rules of war. Notice our past perfect again a past action before another past action. So maybe this is the older past action. So the newer past action could have been, he had broken the legal rules of war before he met Queen Elizabeth, because up here they have him with Queen Elizabeth. So this is a past action. It's already in the past, but we're talking about a past action before this, this past action. So he had, I'll write that again for you so you can practice. He had broken the moral rules of war before he met Queen Elizabeth. So remember, this is the older action and this is the newer action, but they are both past actions disgracing his country in the process. Let's take a look at disgrace. This is a verb and this is when you make people stop respecting you or your family, team, your company by doing something very bad or wrong. So remember, before this case, he was a beloved, decorated soldier in Australia, but then it came to light that he had done all these terrible things. So now he has embarrassed his country. He's disgraced his country, disgracing his country in the process. Now let's continue. But the media outlets say they reported the truth and have set out to prove it. Let's take a look at this. To set out to do something. In this case, to prove it. What's the it? Remember, the it is that this decorated soldier did commit all these things that they said. So there is no defamation because it's true. That's what they want to set out to prove. And this simply means that they're going to start trying to do that specific thing. So in this case, they're going to start trying to prove that he committed those crimes. So you might say, I've set out... I've set out to improve my English speaking <laughs> skills. Does this describe you? Are you going to start trying to improve your English speaking skills? If this describes you, put it in the comments. I've set out to improve my English speaking skills. And notice, to set out, this is in the present perfect. Let's continue on. It is the first time in history any court has been tasked with assessing allegations of war crimes by Australian forces. An allegation is a claim that someone has done something wrong without evidence. Okay, without evidence. So at this point is just a claim, a claim that someone has done something wrong, like the war hero, the soldier who committed war crimes. But at this point is just an allegation without, without evidence or proof. So the media wants to explain that there is evidence, there is proof. So it's not, in fact, an allegation. It's the truth. So again, it's not defamation. And notice this sentence structure. To be tasked with something, and then that something is either a noun or a verb in ing. So let me give you an example. I've been tasked with 
helping my students improve their speaking <laughs> skills. So of course, a task is something that you need to do. But if I've been tasked with it, it sounds like someone else is giving me the task. So maybe it's just my students who constantly say, Jennifer, can you help me improve my speaking spill skills? So I can say I've been tasked with. And then notice the verb with I-N-G. Let's continue. Lasting 110 days and costing up to an estimated 25 million Australian dollars. Now in this context, the A stands for Australian, simply because this article is for a worldwide audience. And when you see the dollar sign, you assume it's American dollars. So they put the A to represent Australian dollars. Of course, if this is a newspaper in Australia, they wouldn't put that because for them, that is the currency. This is just for an international audience, so we understand it's Australian dollars. The trial has heard extraordinary and at times bizarre evidence about every facet of Mr. Robert Smith's life. Bizarre is an adjective that means very strange and unusual. So at times, strange and unusual evidence. Hmm, now I'm curious, what is this bizarre evidence? You could use this because it's an adjective. You could say her behavior was very bizarre. It was very strange and unusual, bizarre. Her behavior was very bizarre or the movie was very bizarre. You could use that as well. The movie was very bizarre. It was strange. It was unusual. It was bizarre. Every facet of. Facet is a way to say every part of, every element of, every piece of. I'll write that out for you. So every part, element, aspect, piece, these are all synonyms that you can use piece of. So of course he has different parts of his life. He has his, his family life, his friends, his hobbies, his sports, his work, his community. Those are the facets of his life, the aspects, the pieces of his life. So this evidence is about every facet of, so not just his work or his family, also how he acts in the community or the hobbies he enjoys, every facet of his life. It sparked a media frenzy. So this verb to spark, it simply means that it created. The media frenzy was created because of this trial. So it created. So the frenzy wouldn't have existed without this. It created, created. Now, what is frenzy? Frenzy simply means uncontrolled or really excited, uncontrolled, excited. So if you say there was a media frenzy when Brad Pitt arrived, so Brad Pitt arrived and there are tons and tons of different people taking pictures, asking questions. Nobody is controlled. Nobody is respecting Brad Pitt's personal space. Oh, Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt. They're putting a microphone, a camera in his face and everyone is very excited. That would be a frenzy. Captured national attention and has made Mr. Robert Smith the public face of accusations of Australian war crimes in Afghanistan. After sifting through, when you sift through something, it means you go through something or review something in a lot of detail. So if I have all these different pages in a notebook and I read each and every page very, very carefully, I sifted through the notebook. So let me write that for you. So to review information very carefully, 
to review information carefully. And you're doing that so you can determine what's useful or what's not useful. After sifting through volumes of evidence, this week a judge is due to hand down a decision. When you hand down a decision, it simply means that you make your decision public, but it's used with authorities because the judge, once the judge decides, that is a legally binding decision. Yes, he can appeal the decision, but until he appeals the decision, that decision is legally binding. So if your boss hands down a decision because your boss has authority to make decisions, if you don't like the decision, Unfortunately, there probably isn't a lot you can do. So we use hand down a decision when it's someone in a position of authority who makes a decision. So when the judge is due to hand down a decision, so I'll just write that note for you, to make a decision. So the judge is due to make a decision, and I'll just note only used... When the decision is made by someone with authority. So when that person shares the decision, that decision is final. But remember, every decision can be appealed or there are official processes that you can follow if you don't agree with a decision, even if it is made by someone with authority, even if that decision is handed down. The judge is due to hand down a decision in the historic case. So soon we will find out, this week we will find out what that decision is. Now that's the end of the story. So what I'll do now is I'll go to the top and I'll read the article from start to finish. And this time you can focus on my pronunciation. Ben Robert Smith, how decorated soldiers defamation case has rocked Australia. For months on end, Australia's most decorated living soldier sat stoically in a Sydney courtroom as dozens of witnesses accused him of war crimes, bullying peers, and assaulting his mistress. But Ben Robert Smith was not the one on trial. The 44-year-old had brought the case, suing three Australian newspapers over a series of articles in 2018, which he says defamed him. He argues they ruined his life by painting him as a callous man who had broken the moral and legal rules of war, disgracing his country in the process. But the media outlets say they reported the truth and have set out to prove it. It is the first time in history any court has been tasked with assessing allegations of war crimes by Australian forces, lasting 110 days and costing up to an estimated 25 million Australian dollars. The trial has heard extraordinary and at times bizarre evidence about every facet of Mr. Robert Smith's life. It sparked a media frenzy, captured national attention, and has made Mr. Robert Smith the public face of accusations of Australian war crimes in Afghanistan. After sifting through volumes of evidence, this week a judge is due to hand down a decision in the historic case. Amazing job with your weekly lesson. Now, don't forget to leave your feedback. Did you like this style of lesson? Did you not like it? Let me know in the comments because if students like it, I'll keep creating these weekly summaries. But if students don't like them, then obviously I won't make them. So share your feedback in the comments below. And don't forget to download this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can download it from my website right here. And if you want, to keep going, you can get started with your next lesson right now.